This is a video about deflection. We'll start right away. Let's say that you've been given a job to turn this diameter to 901 thousandths with a tolerance of plus or minus 5 ten thousandths of an inch. And you just went past your number because you didn't accurately assess the force or deflection on that pass. You, know, you took roughing passes of 50 thousandths and left one finished pass of 10 thousandths, but the tool took off 12 thousandths. Now, if you're working with a tolerance of 5 ten thousandths of an inch, and you really have to sneak up on your number. But as a machinist, if it takes you all day to make five parts, then you're costing money. You're not making money. And when you become a setup man, your job is accuracy and efficiency. You may get a requirement for only four parts and only be given material for four parts, allowing no scrap. So you need to be aware of deflection. We're going to talk about two different types of deflection, tool deflection and part deflection. And the first one is tool deflection. As you can see, we've got an end mill going across this part. It's only taken about a quarter of an inch at a pass. If I was to take that end mill all the way down the side and try and take it all at one time and go all the way around the profile of this part, what you'd probably see is that the bottom would be wider than the top. And if you had a perpendicularity call out for the part, you probably wouldn't make it. You overcome tool deflection with spring passes and maintaining constant even load on the tool among other methods. There's also part deflection and as you can see with this bar stock in the chuck the further out it's sticking the more deflection there's going to be and you could have difference in dimensions from one end to the other once it's turned of five ten thousandths depending on how far it's sticking out of the chuck. Once again, we'll overcome this deflection with spring passes and maintaining constant even load on the tool and also using a live center when possible. So the thing is to be aware of tool deflection and learn new techniques to work with it whenever possible. That's it. Thanks for watching. It's a video about backlash and how to eliminate it. And backlash happens in older machines. And what it is, it's the play in drive screws that comes with wear. And how we eliminate this is with positive approach. That means what we're going to do is we're going to back up at least two full turns and watch your tool and come into our number so that we take out all the wear in the ball screw or the Acme thread. And this works coming and going. Be careful that you're not going to run into any material when you're doing this. And that's the basics of backlash. Thanks for watching. This is a video about the witness pass. And the witness pass is a rough pass used to establish a baseline dimension. And the first thing we want to do is to touch off the tool without starting the spindle. So I'll move in and gently touch the edge of the tool. And I'm going to use that to set a zero on the hand wheel. And now without moving the tool, I'm going to set it to zero. And now I'll back away and go back past the face of the part. And this time I'm going to go past the zero, about 40 thousandths in, to clean everything up. And then I'll take that pass far enough to get a measurement and before I measure I'm going to want to deburr the edge of the part now I can take a measurement and know exactly what the diameter is and I can reset the hand wheel to zero and they'll both match now and that's a witness pass thanks for watching This is cutter compensation basics. What is cutter comp? It's a method of shifting the tool path to reach print dimensions. Cutter compensation allows the programmer to use the part geometry exactly from the print for programmed coordinates. Without using compensation, the programmer has to know the cutter size and offset the program coordinates for the geometry by the amount of the radius. 
Now what it means is this. When you set up the machine, it needs to know how big the tool is so it can calculate the distance to offset the tool center line from the part edge at dimension, meaning a good part. This tool is half an inch in diameter, so the machine needs to know so it can calculate 0 .250 from the center line. Now when the machine loads the program and cuts the part, it should theoretically cut to 2.0 inches on all profile dimensions. And now we've run a few parts and our tool got worn out and we've got to put a new one in. And the new tool is only 475 thousandths in diameter. So if we just put it in, we're not going to make specification on our part anymore. See the new tool is 25 thousandths smaller in diameter. And that's 12 and a half thousand smaller on the radius. When we set up the machine, we told it the diameter was a half an inch. So it still thinks that tool is a half an inch in diameter and the tool path is going to be too far away from the part. We have an outside profile dimension tolerance of 2 inches 010, which means that we're going to end up being two and a half thousandths over tolerance on the part if we don't compensate that tool. Now at this point we could go back into where we set up the machine and change the actual tool diameter itself, but we could also use an offset to do that. In this case it'll be a diameter offset. So of course the machine still thinks that we have a half inch diameter tool in there, and that would be the center line exactly 250 thousandths away from the edge of the part but our tool is 475 thousandths in diameter. And that means that the center line is supposed to be 0.2375 away from the edge of the part. But we're at 0.250 right now. So, we need to adjust the center line in half the distance of the difference of the diameter, which is 12 and a half thousandths. So we're gonna go minus 12 and a half thousandths on the diameter. And I would do that by going to the offset screen and scrolling over to the diameter. And I would just, as soon as I'm highlighted on that, I would put in minus 0 0.0125 and hit tool offset measure. And that would automatically change that diameter for me. And if you could see it, the tool would move in 12 and a half thousandths and be right up against the edge of the part. This also works for the tool length offset, but it's just one for one, obviously, because you're not dealing with a diameter versus a radius. So cutter compensation gives the ability to use any size cutter smaller or larger in diameter than what was originally programmed, provided the exact diameter is entered into the offset screen. It also works for finite adjustments in the tool path, which bring the part into tolerance. That's the basics of cutter compensation. Thanks for watching. This is an explanation about the difference between a climb cut and a conventional cut. The conventional cut has the spindle turning clockwise and is advancing on the material. And that's the conventional cut, clockwise advancing on the material. Here's the climb cut. We're still clockwise, and now we're moving in the other direction on the material. So we're actually climbing on it or rolling over the material. And that's the climb cut versus the conventional cut. Thanks for watching. This is Introduction to Feeds and Speeds. It's designed to give you a ground floor understanding of the principles of spindle speed, RPM, and feed rate of the tool in inches per minute. Since it's a beginner's video, we won't be discussing complex issues like plunge rate and tool engagement angle. We'll stick to the basics. First up, spindle speed. Spindle speed has to be right to get the proper surface finish, to get maximum efficiency out of cycle times, and to get optimum tool life. This is a hard inch chucker. And here are the controls. Speed up, slow down. 
This is an engine lathe, and these are the spindle controls matching up the two levers. Here's a mill. Crank the handle one way, the other way to slow it down. This mill changes manually. Pull the motor forward, and you can change the belts. And now we'll talk about feed rate, and that's expressed in inches per minute. The feed rate is controlled on this engine lathe by using the tables provided. The feed actuator lever starts the saddle in motion. On a CNC, feeds and speeds are controlled by MDI through an NC file or through the Toolpath Manager in a CAD file. One advanced concept related to feeds and speeds is surface feet per minute. So what is SFM for machining? Surface feet per minute is a combination of diameter and the velocity, RPM, of the material measured in feet per minute at the spindle of a milling machine or lathe. The faster the spindle turns, and or the larger the diameter, the higher the SFM. As a beginner, consult others who have ran projects similar to yours. Watch NC programs as they run to see what spindle speed and feed rate works best. There are many varieties of feed and speed calculators online and available through other resources. It can be a lot of trial and error, but once you've got it, you'll make yourself more valuable. Thanks for watching.